And we are live. Hello, hello, everybody. We are here. Prime time. I want to apologize to all of the iZombie fans out there. I totally <laughs> did not realize that I was scheduling this during iZombie. That <laughs> have to. <laughs> What's that look like? I didn't know it was on. I can't do this. I have to stop. <laughs> it's such a good show. But I'll watch it tomorrow online because we have another website up. So I do really, really appreciate it with all the awesome TV that's on right now that you are choosing to hang out and chat with us and ask us crafty questions. I have a full house here today. Um, I want to introduce our special guest. First of all, my better half, Jason, is here. He's going to be relaying your questions to me. Good evening. And I have Cinnamon Cooney, the art Sherpa. And oh, all hey of everybody, the, how you doing? All of their channels will be huh? in the video description, and also in an info card, so you can check these guys out. Subscribe to them; they have so much great co content, wonderful reviews, tutorials, everything. And um, Cinnamon, will you, do you want to tell us a little bit about your channel? My channel is acrylic painting for beginning artists or artists that are returning to painting after they've been away for a really long time. And we just get everybody back on that creative journey again in a really safe, fun environment. Live three times a week. <laughs> it's awesome. Her shows are so fun to watch. And we also have Lisa, the artist behind Lakari Fine Art. How are you tonight? I am great. How are you guys? Good. Do you want to tell everyone a little bit about your channel? My channel, I have videos every Tuesday where I'm critiquing your original paintings or drawings, my own speed paintings, drawings, and tutorials, and oil, acrylic, color pencil, pencil, charcoal, airbrush. I'm sure I'm missing ink tents. Lots of mediums there on Wednesdays. And then I do art Q&A and artist vlogs two other days during the week. And I think you talk almost as fast as I do, so people's heads are going to explode tonight. <laughs> I know. Do you get a lot of complaints for that? I get so many complaints. I do all the time. <laughs> We have Marty Owens from Owens Art. Marty, tell us a little bit about your channel. Well, just mostly do art reviews and uh, art supply reviews, things like that. We I do a little uh, segment called Art Adventures. I go out and sketch and paint in the field. And um, I just want to say how happy I am to be here because I have at, I have binge watched each of your channels at least once in the last month. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> And last but certainly not least, we have Steve from the Mind of Watercolor. Hi, Steve. How are you doing? Hey, guys. How's it going? Great. Well, Tell us a little bit about what you do on your channel. Okay. Uh, Mind of Watercolor. I do mostly quick tips, techniques, uh, some material reviews related to watercolor, and I try to keep them short. I'm sort of the snack food of art instruction. That's what I like to say. <laughs> and it's all about watercolor and getting into the mind of it. Awesome. I love your co-host. Is he there with you tonight? He is. Reese is <laughs> right here watching. Awesome. <laughs> I bet he's, he's a little probably, shy. So. He'd probably rather be watching Eye Zombie tonight. <laughs> Can't blame him. Can't say I blame him. So, right. I want to uh, want to welcome all you guys that are hanging out with us tonight. And if you have a question, please type it in the chat. And please uh, type in all caps. My husband is looking at the chat, and he's going to ask us the questions. If you want to direct your question to a particular guest here, just type um, their name before it. Otherwise, I'll kind of field it or send it to uh, whoever I think could answer it best. And I'm sure there'll be some lively discussions, because I'm sure you know you ask one question to five different artists, you're going to get five different answers. So you'll have a good Variety. You'll get a fair and balanced, probably the only fair and balanced broadcasting going on tonight with the primaries going on, so you will get a fair and balanced art thing, art fun, fair and balanced, I guess. Well <laughs> said. <laughs> I, yeah, someone's going to call me up by offering me a job in broadcasting any day now. Okay, uh, so do we have any questions in the chat right now? Um, no, a lot of people are saying hi and uh, hello from lots of different places. I haven't seen actual questions yet, though. Oh, cool, cool. Oh, and if you want to tell us where you're from, feel free to do that. I do have a few <laughs> questions that I printed off from my blog earlier today. Do we have something humorous? Yeah, how do I become better at art? <laughs> oh, <laughs> Start off with an easy one. <laughs> <laughs> okay, here's something a little more specific. My Copic white has dried out. Is there anything you can do to revive it? Uh, well, if it's a the Copic has reinkers for all of their markers, I believe, and I think they run between. You can get say get them on sale. They're between five and eight dollars, depending on where you buy it. And um, there's like a little needle tool, and you can you can fill it right up. Yeah, the nibs get hard, and the problem with that is like you, you, you people try to reactivate those nibs, but just go and replace it. It's like two bucks. 
I seriously, because it's not worth the effort of trying to uh, get that nib soft again. It's just, really, I, I've struggled with it with the brush tip. Oh wow! I've never had any. So it must be once they really, really dry out that they. I, I've had that happen, yeah, with the Copics. But like I say, rather than try to make that thing come back to life, it's like two bucks. Just go get, save yourself a headache, and go get one. <laughs> Good tip. Got a question for Cinnamon? How can I lighten my poinsettia reds with glazing or dry brushing? Well, that's sort of interesting because you can use either technique to alter your painting. So if you were to do glazing, that's a very translucent technique, right? So a lot of what was underneath would still be showing through and that would be very slow stepping. If you were to use dry brushing, you'd be allowing a lot of what was underneath to show through and the color would be skipping over the tooth. And what I would do is when you're looking at it, do little test spots and see what's giving you the effect that's getting you the direction you're trying to go with the painting. But you can use either. I, like I always say, there's not really one road in art. There's like the likely road and then a bunch of roads some other artists paved on their own doing their own thing. Great advice. I would dry brush. <laughs> Someone just asked, uh, said that they were just asked what color palette do they use, and they gave a blank stare. So I guess they're looking for a little guidance on what to, they don't know what to tell people. Oh, when people ask what color yeah. palette they use? Yeah. Uh, yeah, maybe I'm kind of getting the that. terminology, maybe just. Yeah, when somebody asks what color palette they're using, anybody? I just list when my videos whichever colors I used, but it's I mean it depends on what I'm painting. There's no set color palette that I use, so that I can't really answer that. Yeah. Universally. So you want to say I'm using um, the color palette of Turner, meaning you know that artist's color palette or or something like that. <laughs> yeah, that's a weird one. They might be asking like. Um, what like uh, Drema Toll Parish is doing, you know how she works in all the gems and quinacridones. She's a really set palette so that she gets a very particular hi-hat color result every time. So sometimes people are trying to ask if you have like, a, my mom Ginger Cook has had the same palette for 30 years. <laughs> And it's very consistent, and so if she ever gets any colors out of that, it's like a color surprise. It really pops out of her palette. And she's a very traditional, historic palette. Oh, okay. Maybe maybe they mean that. Yeah, could, yeah. That's probably what they if mean. I, can, uh, I get no, asked this what, is, what this a is John. starting palette is a lot. I don't know if that's what they're talking about. I'm usually real hesitant to answer that because it's like, you know, telling people what clothes to wear or, you know, what car to buy. You know, you could... Uh, you know, buying and using color palette is very personal and depends on what you paint. So um, a lot of times people ask me that question, what do you recommend for a starting palette? And I just kind of hem and haw and skirt the question. Um, I like to recommend that people start with like two of every primary for watercolor just so they can get a good mix. And then if they fall in love with, you know, a different cool red, then to substitute sure. it, you know, sure. as they gain experience. I guess, and trying to give people the most bang for their buck, you know, I guess. Sure. I got a question about packing your paintings, uh, canvas or watercolor for shipping. Anybody do Any a lot of shipping? for that? Cinnamon, you ship, don't you, quite a bit? Yeah, I ship quite a lot, and I've shipped out of the country and from out of the country back to the country. Um, and really, it's dependent on the value of the work. If you have a really valuable work, you're going to want to crate it in a wood crate, and it gets really expensive. But if you're just shipping your own paintings, um, you want to create like an isolation layer of something that will protect the surface of the medium. Like in acrylic, I like to wrap with tissue and then hit some bubble wrap. And then to save money, I like to build a box. I don't want to give them any extra weight or anything. And then mostly, my experience has been you can ship easily just in the box because you really can only claim, unless you're very established and you're insured and bonded, you can only claim the value of the materials. So just the cost of canvas and the paint and those things actually gets reimbursed by the post office. So you might as well not kill yourself too much, you know, on shipping. and Because and, you can do the $250 crate. Right, we're, we're shipping, and if I were shipping to a big show, like if I were going to Art Expo, I'm going to drop everything in a crate because I don't know how it's going to be unloaded. I don't know how it's going to be taken to the wall, and I have to sell it. But if it's just going from me to a client, I'm just going to do a really good job packing it. I'm going to build a box and ship it. 
Okay, that's great. Um, Lisa, what about doing works on paper? Would you ever put it in a tube or would you mail it as a flat? Or what I've would done you both. Do? If I ship internationally, it will always be in a tube because it just costs way too much, like an insane amount to try to ship something large and flat. So that's always going to be in a tube. If I'm s shipping here within the U.S., then if it's a matted piece, I'm going to ship it flat and I'm going to make my own box. I basically just go to the container store and get a huge box and cut it down to the size that I need. It's all bubble wrapped and wrapped in glassine first and then the bubble wrap on top of that. The thing is, with like you were saying with the insurance, it's they don't, even with UPS, unless they pack it themselves, you're really not insured, even though you're paying for insurance. All your the insurance is covering is making sure they don't lose it, which is a rant, side rant of mine, because if I'm paying you to ship it, then it should be covered that you don't lose it. But yeah, that's always a scary thing when shipping artwork, so you just pack it as great as you can, and I use a lot of cardboard to keep it very flat if I'm not wrapping it in the tube. Great advice. All right, what do we have next? Uh, all right, how about some uh, cheap but good quality acrylic paints for beginners? All right, let's see. Marty, you're the review king. Have you done much for acrylic reviews? Not really. Uh, I don't do much with acrylics at all. Uh, to p tell you the honest truth, I'm sure Cinnamon will hate me for this, but if I need acrylic, I just go to Walmart and buy the stupid little tubes <laughs> for a little 99-cent deal. I'm a horrible acrylic painter. I'm sorry. I'll, I throw it to you, Cinnamon. Well, I mean, I think I, I'd be interested also to hear what Lisa also has to say with this. Um, right now, I think I, I like the mid-tier. I think the Galleria acrylics are pretty solid, economic acrylic. I'm uh, going to test the System 3 by Dollar and Rally uh, because they're international. I'm trying to find more international paints. The issues with the paints as they come down in cost is just simply that the paint companies... Uh, cut costs in the binders and the ingredients and in the pigments and so that it can just make you can still get a good painting with it but it just makes more work for you in that process or it can give you certain challenges you know and I always say that you've got to balance getting the best paint that your budget allows so you got to work your sales um, I do pro paints but I work my sales really really hard so I'm not getting hit with those costs um, and you just got to look at it get paint from a company that has been in business for a long time, that has a website, a customer service desk that will answer questions. It's great if they have uh, videos or tips for more information on their website. You just want somebody that's backing their product and they're willing to answer to you if something goes wrong. And try not to buy from somebody that does not has not been in business for a second, that does not have a help desk because you're going to end up with like, I, I've had um, acrylic paint that I, my best guess is that it had fruit dye in it, maybe, maybe that's what it was, not sure, certainly didn't ever cure, didn't ever set, lifted back up, couldn't do anything with it, it was definitely some type of really unstable dye from an off brand, so I think any of them that are in business, but I'd be interested to see if there's um, an economic brand Lisa's been liking. I have been using, since I started painting with acrylics, and that was my primary medium for many years, Liquitex Basics. And I have stuck with these. I love this paint. It's low cost. At least here in the U.S., it is so easy to get. Every store carries it. There are a few colors I'm not in love with. Some of the oranges, yellows, magentas, they're a little gooey. But then I can switch over to the heavy body if I need to. But the Liquitex Basics, because of the way that I layer and the way that I use the charcoal pencil to draw my next layer out, they have a very flat cert or finish whereas a higher gloss finish like the heavy body that charcoal pencil isn't going to stick to. So I just stick with the Liquitex Basics. I have been so happy with them and while they are flat, when you put a shine, a gloss varnish over them, they look like an oil painting when they're done. I mean, they're a very nice painting. They work great for airbrushing. I love them all around for all of my acrylic paintings and they are tend to be considered a lower end or budget paint because they are the student brand, but I love them. That's all I use. Very good, and I've had really good luck with the Turner Acryl Gouache if you like a matte finish, but again, you can varnish it if you do want a shinier coat, or very easy to find is a Delta Ceram coat, which is favored by um, decorative painters, but it's also a very reliable flat paint as long as you don't need the um, the you know peaking and the, the, the heavier, heavier body paint, but perfect for uh, doing decorative arts and jelly printing and you know a nice all-around reliable paint that's easy to find, and, and it's like a dollar a, a two-ounce bottle. So. I just tried the, the Turner, what is it, the Turner acrylic, acrylic gouache? gouache. Yeah. I tried that. It came in my smart art box for these fans that we painted. I really liked it. It was really nice to work with. 
Yeah, I really, and they have a set that's like, it's a set of 12 colors, and it has mixing cards, which is good for a beginner, three brushes, comes in a case with a palette, and it's like 24 bucks at Jerry's at Arama, so it's a, it's a good value, and it, their tubes are small, but you can tell what ones you can replace in larger tubes if you really yeah. love it, so, yeah. All right, moving right along. Uh, okay, uh, this is directed at Lisa, what's the difference between the luminance and... Derwent whites you've been using. Yeah, the Derwent drawing, Chinese white, and the luminance. The Derwent drawing has a wider barrel. It's a thicker, softer core, and so it's not as great for fine, fine detail, but it's the most opaque colored white colored pencil that I use. The luminance I will switch over to for the finer detail. The teeny tiny stuff is where I really like the, the luminance. Still opaque, just not as opaque as the Derwent drawing, Chinese white, but again, the luminance is going to give you the detail that the Derwent drawing can't. Very good. Gouache. That's the word, right? It's gouache. What's, okay. I've heard well you say done. That. <laughs> <laughs> At first I said, what is this word? And then I said, wait, I've heard that before. What's a good gouache brand? Um, let's see. Oh, let's give it to Steve. Steve, you do do you work with gouache as well as watercolor? Uh, some, yeah. Uh, Windsor Newton is fine. It's always had a really good gouache brand. M. Graham makes a really nice gouache. Those two primarily all I've, I've really used. Um, uh, Windsor Newton's usually easy to find for gouache. Most art supply stores carry it. Uh, I see a few places have M. Graham. I don't think the range is quite as big, but those are both great choices. Wonderful. And those are kind of pricey. Um, I think they're probably about $5 a tube and up. If yeah. you are looking for a budget brand, I've done, um, just playing around, I've used the Reeves brand, and that's been, you know, fine for anything I've done. It's nothing too fancy, but if you just want to see if you like it before you invest in M. Graham or Windsor Newton, which I'm sure are way more light fast and, you know, have more pigment causing the opacity rather than white, I think, yeah. you know, it's a good way to get started if you're not sure if you are going to love it or not. Sure. Someone's looking for tips on um, using mineral spirits with colored pencils. Oh, yeah, and we got that question on uh, my blog, too. And uh, Lisa, have you done that? Yeah, that's what, how I blend my colored pencils. The biggest problem that people have when using odorless mineral spirits is that they don't get enough pigment on the paper before they start blending. They'll put a light layer, and then they blend with the paint thinner and expect that paint thinner, the odorless mineral spirits, expect it to have this rich color, and it won't. If you don't have pigment on the paper, there's nothing for the mineral spirit to dissolve into the paper. So I put about five layers before I ever blend with the paint thinner. After that five layers, it looks still a little grainy, a little gritty. I do another five or six layers, and then I blend with paint thinner. And then another five or six layers. I end up with at least 20 layers of colored pencil total. And every four, five, six layers, I'll blend with the odorless mineral spirits. But I'm still working in small circles. I'm making sure that I'm getting that, that ink, ink, lead, whatever you want to call it, the color, I'm making sure that I get it into all the little crevices of the paper before I start. I'm not just scribbling all over and expecting the odorless mineral spirits to softly blend it like it would with pastels. It's not the same. All I'm doing is dissolving whatever I already applied to the paper. So you want to make sure you've got nice, even coverage, lots of layers, light layers, that's a huge tip. Don't push really hard because you're going to limit how many layers you can do because you're damaging the tooth of the paper. Lots of light layers and then blend. Lots more light layers, then blend. And you can just continue continuously repeat this process. Good. Thank you very much. Someone's looking for an explanation of warm versus cool colors. Oh, right. Marty, do you want to take that one? Sure. Um, well, really, um, all colors can be warm and cool, basically, unless you're talking about a really, really hot red. But you can even cool reds down a little bit. Um, the color that I'm really digging right now is the um, M. Graham or the Daniel Smith Payne's Gray. It's really awesome because that's a really cool gray. It's almost got a blue tint in it. And I use that paint a lot for my shadow work or, or any kind of shading or where I want to denote um, just a cool area. Now Steve probably knows about a little bit more about warming colors up than I do. Um, I tend to work on the cool end of the palette in most of my work, so I'm a lot more at ease with it. Although when I'm using colored pencil, I and and uh, you guys are experts here too, but I find that um, just being able to work in layers helps a lot. So um, I might put down uh, like a warmer layer first and then cool it off, or vice versa. I don't know what the best approach is. I didn't go to art school. There's my disclaimer, but I've just been drawing for about 40 years, so <laughs> just like hard one, uh, you know, school of hard knocks. 
I wonder if they were talking about like the split primary system. Do you think that's what they meant by what's warm versus cool? Like okay. crimson red being cooler and cadmium red being warmer. I'm wondering if that's that's sure. what they're talking. And basically, each primary sure. you can take warm colors to mean red, orange, and yellow, and cool colors to mean you know green, blue, purple. Um, but you could also take each primary and kind of split it and have a color like a red that's closer to orange and a blue that's um, and a, and a red that's closer to purple, and do that for each of the primaries to aid you in mixing vibrant colors so that you yeah. know what red to mix with what blue to get that purple you want. Yeah. And that's generally, um, that's generally when they're, that's, that's, kind of, that's a general way of mixing. Um, that's kind of a little complicated to get into a non-tutorial uh, Q&A, but I, I urge you to look at your paints and see if you can see whether they're warmer or cooler and try mixing, and I think it'll kind of click for you. Um, well, now that you me. mentioned it, I uh, the other night I was just, I was over on Steve's channel like I am most days. Stalking. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> yeah, exactly, lurking around over there. And Steve had this... Uh, this color wheel, uh, primary colors uh, video yeah, that he yeah. did that really explained it well, and it kind of bam, it just hit me. That's, that's well, that's right. yeah, and that's what I was going to say. Most people, there seems to be a lot of confusion between warming and cooling a color, and a warm or a cool color, and it's easy to visualize on the wheel. And I just kind of drew a line, you know, basically cool is what you think of as hot, you know, temperature wise, red through the yellows. And cool is what you think of as cold, like the greens through the blues. But when you're thinking of a color, any color, it can be warmed or cooled by pushing it that way on the color wheel. And, and if you look at it on a color wheel and you're like, say, you're a, a violet, you know, if you're, it, it's closer to the warm side than it is the cold side. So when you push it towards red and then orange, you're pushing, you're warming it. So you can have a warm red and a cool red, and I think that's what confuses people. Let's put a yeah. link to your video in the comments section after the broadcast is over so they can find that video, and I think okay. that would be extremely helpful to a lot it's of people. It's my most recent one, so oh, okay. it'll be easy to find that way, too. Oh, excellent. So. Thank you, Steve. How do you blend Prismacolor markers? Um, well, I can take that one unless anybody else. No, you take okay. it. Um, I like their alcohol markers, so any sort of tutorial you see for like Copics or Spectrum Noirs or Pro markers, you can follow the same advice you're going to get in that tutorial. Um, the way I personally prefer to blend, and I like to work on um, a paper called Nina Classic Crest, is I'll start in with the shadows with my darkest color, and then I'll overlap, um, say it's a petal, and, I, and I'm going to have a tutorial coming up this week explaining this, but say it's a petal, and I have like the shadow, kind of the, the petal that's tucking under another petal, and I would have that with a like a dark cardinal red or something, and I'd color that in, and then I'd overlap it with a slightly lighter pink and pull that color down a little bit, and then I would overlap some of that pink that I just put down with a lighter pink and pull it out to the edge of the petal, and that would give me a subtle blend. That's if you're using a nice marker paper that is, um, or paper that helps you blend, like a vellum or something that's got a little bit of plastic impregnated in it or something that's going to make it kind of puddle a little bit. If you're working on a less expensive card stock, like maybe like the Georgia Pacific from Walmart, um, if you color the entire petal with your lightest color first, then repeat that process of doing the dark, the medium, and the light, you'll get a very similar effect on a much cheaper card stock. The only warning to do that, if you're doing that, is to not go right up to the edge of where you want the color to be. If you're like rubber stamping an image, don't go right up to that line because otherwise you're putting so much ink down that it might feather out past the edge. But with as with anything, there is a learning curve. Practice, practice, practice. Swatch your colors out on the paper that you're going to use for your final work. Try blending different colors together. Definitely make a color chart because it's deceiving. The labels on the Prisma colors um, are deceiving as to as opposed to what the ink is. So you want to make sure you have a accurate color representation and practice, practice. I mean, you'll get it, but there's a learning curve. It's not as um, it's not as easy to blend. I don't think as like a watercolor uh, marker or a watercolor pencil or or a lot of other mediums are. Okay, uh, super flawless. Would like an overview on synthetic brushes versus natural hair brushes. Yeah. Uh, so. did, yeah. Well, what, me what medium did she say? Uh, and then didn't say. Say. That's that's uh, super flawless. Nine is his name is Patrick, and I think he was subscriber number seven on my channel after six <laughs> family members. So he's been around for a long time. I'm happy to to address that quickly. One of the things I recently dug into was like how they source sable or squirrel hair brushes and stuff, and they still 
they still get that from people that go out and trap and hunt animals um, predominantly. So if you're interested in, in how they source that, it's really important to some people, you know, how what's happening to the animal at the end of the day. So I think the synthetic brushes that they make today are um, are almost as good as like the classic sable hair brushes. Honest to goodness, I I see no reason to like perpetuate the trapping and killing of these uh, these animals if you can avoid it. I don't know how the rest of you feel, but I guess that's definitely. Uh, yeah, I I just see. I go ahead, Steve. You you use them a lot more than I do. Well, it it's just. I mean the. Uh, it's not, you know, so much the trapping and all that, uh, although I'm sure that's real important, but it, it's the synthetics today are so good. Uh, what makes a sable such a desirable brush is, oddly enough, is the scales and the split ends because they taper and there are scales in the hairs and there are split ends that hold the water. And the water control is what people always prize. And so the first, the first acrylic synthetic brushes that came out were just straight, and they dumped the water right away. But they are, have gotten so good at making synthetics that mimic hair now, I, I honestly, I can't tell the difference hardly. I mean, you'd get a, a really decent synthetic, like a, a Da Vinci Cosmotop or, a, oh, uh, the one I like is the silver brush black velvet, which Berlin squirrel hair with synthetic, and I mean they are just fantastic. And I've I actually have some sables that I don't like. I mean I don't think they perform well at all. So you, you basic you're you're playing you're paying now for the rarity and the difficulty in getting sable because they're they're much more difficult. And if you're paying a lot of money for a sable, you're not necessarily getting value for your money. Um, I say, I say, if you just look for a great uh, synthetic, and if you're really in acrylic, I, I'm sorry, in watercolors where the fluid management is important, it's not so much in acrylic because that's a viscous paint, but in watercolor where it's very fluid, that's where it's important. And if you just need something, you just get want to get a good quality synthetic that mimics hair, and I think you'll be set. Yeah, and that's a good point. Um, like I found the Princeton Neptune line to be an exceptional quality brush. It's not crazy love expensive. Those. They, I yeah, love they, those. They, hold, they hold. Yeah, loads of water. Great for washes. Great for watercolor. Not appropriate for acrylics. I think um, I don't think they're stiff enough to push that heavy body paint around. But um, but they're excellent. And also the mimics um, are good. Those are um, yeah. by Creative Mark Great. and Jerry's Jerry Um Yeah, the mimics are at Jerry's. Um, and those all right. those all perform really well. The only warning is that sometimes beginners get too much water on there, and then they can't control the intensity of their watercolors. And just like a regular synthetic, like maybe a, a Royal Majestic or Aqualon, because they're inexpensive but quite high quality, I think. Mm -hmm. um, so those were good, but you know I have to say that that personally I do use hog hair when I'm oil painting because um, I find they're more durable than like a synthetic brush. I seem to kill synthetic brushes if I'm oil painting, and I can keep a hog hair brush for ten years, and you know, and it lasts really well. So I feel like the the dumpster quality, you know, the I know I'm gonna throw way less of those away. So for me, it it the fact that it comes from an animal is. I, We're going to eat that pig anyway. No, I, yes, I'm a vegetarian. My, my husband is not. That pig's a goner, so might as well use the hair. Let your that. conscience be clear. <laughs> <laughs> We're using the whole animal here. Yeah. yeah no but basically, you need a stiffer brush for a stiffer paint. Is uh, in the in the natural natural hair like a like a sable or the sable synthetics are for watercolors or or a lighter paint, and the hogs are more for a thicker, a heavier paint. And a lot of your synthetics are pretty a pretty um, are pretty stiff, and I think cinnamon has like I wish you do the flick test that I hear you talking about on your videos for acrylic, knowing if you have a good acrylic brush. Repeat that. Um, you talk about the flick test in your videos when you're talking about having a good acrylic brush, like what it should feel like. I lost her sound. Oh, can anybody else hear me? I can hear you. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. We had kids. Who had questions and so my husband muted us. Yeah, so um, on my acrylic brushes, I paint with a heavier body, um, buttery paint, 
And so for my needs, I do a flick test, and it, I like to think of it as like if it would be a good makeup brush, it makes a terrible acrylic brush for me. But if it would clean like paint off my car, it's a little too stiff. Um, right now, I'm really loving the firm filament from Simply Simmons. Just like genuinely my mom abandoned a brush over here. And I dropped all my Creative Mark Pro strokes and everybody and switched out because it's it's three dollars a brush mm. and it's nice. been giving my not to start nothing with ruby satin silvers but it's giving my sixty dollar brushes a run for their money so I'm kind of loving them and it I've only popped the coating off of one which for me is a miracle nice and that's a simply Simmons so just definitely that like if you put it on your cheek and it's like it just wouldn't feel good to put on that blush yeah. that's a good stiffness you should be yes. able to hear the flick um, See if I can get it in my mic where you can kind of hear it. Oh, and it's, yeah. again, it wouldn't clean rust, but I wouldn't want to put my eye makeup on with it. <laughs> okay. Good enough. What's the next question? Uh, somebody looking for tips to putting together art portfolio. Oh, how about Lakari? Uh, Lisa, what do you think on Lockery. that? Lakari. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, you have to, I didn't go to art school either, so I can only give you so much information as to what they're looking for. Generally, you don't want to fill it full of a hundred different pieces. You want to put your best in there. That's a big deal. Don't try to put everything you've ever drawn. Pull, if you've got 100 pieces, pull most of those out. Go for, check with a the school. They'll give you information. Each school will give you a guideline on what they're looking for, but usually it's going to be under 10. Your best work, and you want original work. You don't want something where you copied another artist's artwork. They're generally not going to be interested in that. They want to see what you created, what you invented and came up with, and that sort of thing. Great. Thank you very much. Does anybody else have anything to add to that? Well, I've, I've hired artists since, and... You know, one of the things that, that's important is to be appropriate to the market uh, because I've, well, I've looked at a lot of portfolios for freelancers that they just, they really didn't research who they were going to, who they were trying to impress. And a lot of it depends on what you're going to do with your portfolio. Are you trying to get a job? Are you trying to sell work? Are you trying to get a gallery? You know, it's... it's know your audience. Bad. Yeah, you got to know your audience. You got to know what it is they're interested in. Um, that cuts through a whole lot right there. All right, Cinnamon, what did you have to add? If you're um, taking a portfolio to a gallery, uh, be really, it's the know your audience. Um, I certainly, in the beginning of my art career, did my you know gallery girl days, and people would come in with their portfolios. And it really doesn't matter if you're the greatest, greatest abstract artist in the world. If you come into a Western representational gallery, they're never carrying you. You know, and I, you would see artists do that. They also came in um, really putting their artwork on inappropriate grounds, on inappropriate surfaces. It just, it wouldn't, they didn't put their best foot forward. They didn't put value into their medium and materials. And so you have to be really present to... You know, it doesn't matter how great the drawing is in general. If you do it on line paper, it's really tough to take that seriously. I'm not in any way name dropping, but there's a conversation that happened online with Stan Lee and me and this artist who was coming up about this exact thing. The kid was really talented, and we were talking about your talent has exceeded your media. You have to recognize when your talent and your skill now requires better materials and better media and that you need to start raising that up because if you can't put it together in a beautiful construct, I agree with Lisa about editing um, and putting, and also um, don't be all over the place. Don't have like some apples and then an abstract and then, you know, a bunny. You've got to have something that your client, your gallery, whoever you're going to can understand who you are as an artist so they can like really quickly at a glance go, yeah, I got it. Which Great. is frustrating, I think, for artists. I think it's the hardest for us to single in and create a body of work is really challenging for an artist. I oh. want it. Good point. Sorry. Just to offer a tip up to people who are starting out, I mean, the internet is a great equalizer now, so um, the minute you think you're talented, you know, somebody on the internet shows you how untalented you are. But here's the thing. If you're starting out and you're an artist, look for alternative places to put your art out there. Like, for instance, you know, I started out just putting stuff in a local coffee house. And then, you know, somebody from a gallery will see it or they'll inquire about it if, if you're good enough. 
I mean, the marketplace decides, right? I mean, it's, it's whatever people out there, the great democracy of art, whatever they decide they like, they buy. But bottom line is, you know, I think you have to search your heart and ask yourself, am I in it to sell paintings? Do I just want to, you know, spread my art around the world? Or what, what do you want to do? I mean, the whole thing with pricing your art and getting it out there. You know, I, I started probably 20, I guess about 15 years ago when Blogspot started. Uh, and I just created a blog and I just started putting art up there on the blog. It wasn't very good. I, I you know, I'm the first one to admit that. But um, over time, you know, it got better and people are interested in that journey, that artistic journey. So if you I think if you're doing it from the right place, it can work out well for you. But look for alternative places to to show your art and display your art and you know, it's just uh, knock on doors because it's so rare now. I mean, everybody's got one of these and they're texting each other. Just have a damn conversation with the neighbor and say, "Hey, do you know anybody interested in looking at art or, you know, hey, is your garage available next Saturday? Whatever it is, there's always an opportunity out there if you're willing to look for it. I'll walk around with my girls selling Girl Scout cookies and, hey, want to buy painting too? <laughs> hey, why not, you know, whatever it takes. I uh, one, one tip that I, I've, I've seen and, and heard and it really works, it's, it's worked with me, um, always ask for a review. Always ask for a portfolio review. Uh, this is big. Comic, comic guys... All the time, Steve. All the time. Yeah. They're always they're saying this, and it it opens doors. It and you, if you go in for for one thing, it it shows that you have a humble attitude. You're willing to to learn. It also is kind of admitting without admitting, you know, that you don't necessarily think your portfolio is all that. You're working on it, and get tips. But at the same time, they can see if you have talent that you have talent and. And so, you know, whether it be a gallery owner or, you know, you're trying to get a job at a print shop, I don't care. You know, you just get a portfolio review, ask for it, see if they'll give it to you and give suggestions. Just one quick one on that, Steve. I want to piggyback on that because I've had this happen a lot. And, you know, if, if you're humble, uh, here's the thing. Your friends will tell you what's wrong with your art. Your real friends will tell you what's really wrong with your art. <laughs> That's so, right. You know, if, if, if you find somebody who's willing to share and critique uh, honestly with you, that's worth its weight in gold in my book because so many people go, oh, that looks really great. It looks nice. They don't want to hurt your feelings or spoil it. But, but what you really need is you need to get better. And, and, and if somebody's willing to hit you with the hard truth, sometimes that's the best medicine i found. Yeah. Very good. Very good. What do we have next for a question? Uh, how do you make the time for your art if you have a full-time job. Oh, <laughs> goodness. Who wants to take that one? I, it's I'm all about of, sorry, scheduling. Doing this is something time. that I talk to people about all the time. You have got to set a schedule. If you don't, it's not going to happen. You're going to get home. You're going to be tired. You're going to realize iZombie is on, and <laughs> you're not going to get the artwork done. You have to set a schedule. When I get home, I'm going to do this and this and this. And as artists, I think we hate schedules. I passionately hate to schedule anything. But yeah. if I didn't, there's no way I could get the amount of work that I do done. Yeah. You have you have to consider with me, I technically have two jobs because I've got the videos and then I've got to create artwork on top of that. So I'm working a morning job and then a night job every single day and if I didn't have a set schedule, no artwork would get done and ever. Like, ever. You have to set a schedule mm -hmm. of from this hour to this hour, I'm going to sit down at that easel and I'm going to create. Yep, get a, make, get a priority. I'm terrible at it. <laughs> You know, if it's in your heart, though, if it's in your heart to create and that's what you do, that's what you live for, you'll make time for it. I got a message the other day, you know, and I'm sure you guys get these all the time. It's like, how do I become a better uh, artist? Yeah. So here's the hard truth. You, you have to work like hell, sacrifice like crazy, set aside the time, and treat it like a child. Uh, you know, and raise it and nurture it and groom it over and over again. It's the 10,000, do something 10,000 times to get decent at it. And I don't mean to sound preachy, but I get this question a lot. And it's like, you, you got to invest and you have to be a steward of your life. And I, I think exactly what Lockery said, you've got to get out there and schedule it. And if you don't set aside that time, you're, you're, you know, you're, you're not really loving it if you don't do that. Would you agree, Steve? I would. It's it's a real struggle. I'm supporting myself as a freelance illustrator and designer, and YouTube is just sort of, sort of an up and coming thing. And you know, I'm constantly grappling with I've got to keep my clients happy, but 
you know, I really want that channel to grow, and I'm looking at that for a possible retirement thing, and, you know, it's like, oh, you know, and I'm, as much as I, I hear what Lisa's saying, I am so terrible at it, and yet, you know, it, it's so important, so it's it's a struggle. It's a struggle every day, every week. It's kind of like exercise, too. Like, if you say, I'm just going to do it for five minutes, and then if I feel like quitting, I'll quit. And I think a lot of times if we get so we get so lazy where, okay, well, it's so easy to scroll through Pinterest or scroll through Facebook if we're coffee <laughs> at night and we know, oh, do I want to go to the studio? You know, but to say, okay, I'm going to do it for five minutes, just like I'm going to get on the treadmill for five minutes. Well, if I'm already sweaty, I might as well, you know, do it for half an hour and get, you know, it's the same thing with art. If you, you know, say, I'll just do it for ten minutes, and then if I feel like quitting, I'll quit. A lot of times you'll stick through it because you do enjoy it. I'm like the treadmill, it's actually something that you're passionate about and you enjoy. But I totally get it how you can be tired at the end of the day and just be like, oh, I just don't feel like, you know, doing anything else but flipping through my phone. I mean, you really do, but you just have to. You just have to start. That's the hardest thing is just get going, and then and then you'll feel like continuing once you've just kind of gotten that push. Getting started is the hardest part, huh? It is, I think. Um, someone is asking Steve for recommendations on watercolor paper. Uh, well, Arches is my favorite. Um, it, it's not necessarily the best, but it's the it's the easiest to find uh, of the best. Um, I I mean I think it's it's probably one of the best. I like Fabriano Artistico. I like uh, I'm just recently trying uh, Saint Cuthbert's Mill, the um, UK brand. Oh, uh, uh, Waters Saunders Waterford. Um, they had some on sale, I think, at Jerry's. I bought some, and it's really, really nice. Those are two. Those are three of your top ones. But Arches, you can get that literally everywhere. And of the most available brands, it's probably the best. Um, yes, yeah, I've, I've never had any any problems with it. And you, uh, you, 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 I went and watched one of your videos once where you said, uh, you know, don't bother stretching your paper. Just buy 300-pound watercolor paper, exactly. which yeah. was a great tip for me. I Took that or time. the uh, watercolor board, their their hot press watercolor board or cold press watercolor board is fantastic. Yeah, and Canson makes a great watercolor board as well, which I use all the time. Yeah. yeah. Uh, to, to piggyback on this question, one that was less left on my blog was that, uh, um, and this is something I don't do, but maybe either of you, do you seal your watercolor paintings? Like, if you were sending a watercolor card to somebody, is there a product that you could use to protect that, where it's not something that would necessarily go in a frame? Mm -hmm. I don't seal mine, uh, but I know people that do. Um, I, I always put mine in a mylar sleeve or, or, or frame it. If I'm going to frame it, it goes behind glass. But if it's going to be like a card and you need to protect it, uh, Damar varnish is acceptable. The Krylon clear. They even have, have a UV clear that yeah. works. The only problem is you got to be careful because it can change the color or the, the lightness or darkness to your watercolor. And you really have to, yeah, exactly. You really have to, to put it on in very, very light coats. Excellent. And Marty, what do you have there for well, products to show us? I don't really use this on my watercolor, but it's, it's pretty good varnish. I, I use it on my uh, charcoal and pencil drawings. You know, I'm just, if I'm going to work it later on, I use this Krylon. You know, the people at Wet Paint, which is my local art store in St. Paul, which is a great place, plug for Wet Paint. Um, they always recommend that I don't use this. They they have better brands and stuff that are, but they're like thirty five bucks a can, and I'm like, if if, if it's thirty five bucks a can, it better have some other purpose, you know. But uh, so it just seems expensive. So I I just use the cheap stuff. Sorry. <laughs> well, that sounds good for like a card, I think, especially or a postcard or something where it might just be a sketch, but you know, you still want it to last or be protected mm -hmm. to get through the mail and whatnot. I think that's great advice. But what else do we have? Any advice for working with acrylic ink on vellum? Uh, cinnamon, have you done that? I've worked with gouache on vellum, but I haven't worked with acrylic inks on vellum. I wonder so if they're doing maybe pen, maybe. pen or brush yeah. work, I wonder. Yeah, it, yeah, it probably would. Cause so like an ink wash? Not, not a gouache, a wash. Sorry. <laughs> Uh, that's all the information we have. I would say, well, let's see. I, trying to think, acrylic will it will if you use too much of it, the acrylic ink will buckle the vellum a little bit. I think, won't it? Because mm -hmm. it does have some, yeah. it does have some paper in it. It's not all plastic. Um, I think I would probably use it in a pen. 
and like a, a dip pen and um, you know kind of sketch it out and try to keep try not to add any additional water to it if you don't have to because the more water you add the more buckling you're going to get um, that would be my advice not knowing what exactly they're doing with it whether they're painting or brushing or doing pergamano or or what yeah Simon, do you use Upo have you ever used Upo uh, wait what it's called Upo it's like a polyethylene uh, paper <sighs> Uh, I have some, no. but I've never used it. I like it. It's very footloose and fancy free type of paper. I have a whole ring of it. I was crazy about it about 15 years ago, and I really haven't gotten it out lately. I did something about a year ago with it, but I like it. Yeah, I, I love what I've seen done on it. I've seen some really neat stuff done on it. Yeah, I tried the, uh, the Windsor and Newton pigment markers, you know, on regular paper, and it was a total bomb. And I tried <laughs> it on the Upo, and the Upo was cool because the the um, you can move the marker color around a little bit, and I, I don't know. I've seen guys use graphite wash on that Upo and just do extraordinary things. There's other brands of it, but I, I thought oh, yeah. maybe cinnamon. You tried that with like an ink wash or an acrylic or something. No, no. I have um, like the last ten years have been primarily focused on um, canvas medium and working that. Um, the I've done illumination, like a lot of historic illumination, so that's my familiarity with vellum or rabbit skin or any of that. I haven't played with any of those mediums. And if I get my watercolors out, it's I'm gonna be on arches too, 300 pound. Very good. On my own, left to my own devices. <laughs> Wait, for Lisa, can you use gouache over CPs? Or white, and what do you put a finish on your CP paintings? Must be color pencil. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So here's the thing, and a lot of artists are gonna not necessarily agree with this. People will ask, "Can I put gouache? Can I put acrylic? Can I use gel pens?" I won't use any water-based product on top of an oil or a wax-based product. Archival issues there. Colored pencil takes far too long to be doing something that's probably gonna scrape off. Like, I mean, that's just for me. I won't personally do it. So, yeah, you can. If you do it, use a workable fixative on top first. Yeah. That will allow you to kind of play around and have a little bit more freedom there. Again, I personally won't use it. But if you're going to do it, get a workable fix fixative. Now, here's the thing about the workable fixative. Not all workable fixatives play nicely with all colored pencils. I know that the Fabric Half Style Polychromos, they're oil-based. They don't recommend you spray any kind of seal or anything over it when you're done. So right. some of these fixatives may not play nicely with it. You need to do it on a test piece of paper, do some experimenting, and see if that's going to work for you. Mm -hmm. But I don't seal my colored pencils at all at this point. I will be testing a new colored blender by Aliona Nicholson. She's the one who wrote the colored pencil bible. So I may change how I seal my colored pencils in the future, but for right now, I don't seal anything with them. They're wax and they're oil-based. Once they're behind a frame, they're perfectly safe. It's not like pastels where they're going to kind of fall off the paper. You're pretty safe once it's framed. So that's, um, yeah, that's my opinion on that. Yeah, it goes back to the fat over lean, lean rule. You don't put exactly. lean or mediums over fat or mediums. But I love doing a watercolor wash and then doing color pencil on top because that yeah. takes so much of the work out of the out of the equation. Yeah. And, uh, out of the yeah, I couldn't spend like 40 hours on a painting like you do, Lisa. <laughs> that's, yeah, so exactly. Much. That's extraordinary. Hey, one thing I wanted to add, as long as we're on colored pencils, one question I continually get is, whatever happened to Prismacolor's quality? And I want to talk about that because... Prismacolor is the pencil that my dad, who's an artist, used for years and years. They were the best pencils probably in the world for a long time. In about 1994, Rubbermaid Newell bought Prismacolor. They subsequently laid off all of the experts and the quality control people that handled the manufacture of the pencil and then outsourced it. And so the quality has really diminished. So people always ask me, well, what happened to Prismacolor? They're affordable. I like to use them, but what happened? Now, I know this might be blasphemy for people who are really, you know, strongly Prismacolor fans, but their pencils have just really declined over time. And I try to tell people, if you're going to buy Prismacolor, look for new old stock. Anything that says barrel on it, Prismacolor barrel, you're probably okay. That, that was like pre-90s, 80s and stuff like that. But I don't, I don't, I don't touch them anymore. The only stock I have of Prismacolor is new, new stuff. So I won't use Prismacolor. I stick with Faber Castell or the Luminance 
are amazing. They're a good substitute for a Prismacolor. They cost a lot more, but when you figure the cost, you're spending so much money to use a Prismacolor pencil because you're going to sharpen half the pencil while it breaks continuously on you. Mm -hmm. And I keep having people go, oh, well, you just have to use this sharpener. You just have to, I've used them all. Doesn't it's a matter, matter of did you get lucky and get a good pencil or not. The quality yeah. control is non-existent anymore. Yeah, so, and look, you compare, yeah. That, compare that to the Swiss company, Karen Dosh, who basically, <laughs> they don't even call their places factories. They call them workshops for a reason. You apprentice for 30 years before you can make a pencil. They sing to their trees, okay? <laughs> I, I mean, it, it, yeah, it costs more, but it's worth it's Absolutely. worth every penny, in my opinion. It is, and you're not really spending that much more in the end because those pencils last so much longer. I get so much more use out of the $5 Karen Dosh Luminance than I do a $1.50, or I think they're $2 now, the Prismacolor. The Prismacolors are just, it's not worth the frustration for me anymore. Now, if you are searching for an inexpensive, Expensive, like mid-grade pencil that'll do the job for you. Check out Koinor because I use the Koinor pencils, and Blick sells them under their Blick brand, and I've had really good luck with them. They've been pretty soft. Uh, they're they're soft, a little bit softer, but they they hold up good. They don't break. They're made in the Czech Republic, and the quality control is is pretty good. I I I wouldn't put them up there with Faber Castell or Karen Dosh by any means, but for a good mid-grade pencil like the Lyra brand, uh, the Rembrandts or something like that, they're pretty good. Very good. All right, let's move on to the next question. We get some more of these answered. All right, directed at Cinnamon, do you recommend separate brushes for acrylics and watercolors? Yeah, so if you are an artist who is working and you have some acrylic paintings and you've got some watercolors and maybe you have some oils, I really recommend you separate up those tools. Um, acrylic is just really tough on your brushes. Your good watercolor brushes are going to be too soft for your acrylic painting and they're not really a one-to-one -one exchange. That being said, having all my multimedia friends now, I realize some of you have an art practice where you're like, this one page, it's got some acrylic, it's going to have some of this ink washy stuff over here. And what I would say then is obviously being fussy would not be as practical for you, so wash out, get good soaps that really remove the medium each time you use it, and don't invest in expensive brushes. But if you are like, hey, this is my watercolor Wednesday, and Sunday is acrylics, which is kind of like where I live, I definitely have separate brushes in my house. And I, I would not, I'm always given um, beautiful antique oil brushes. It's a, it's a weird thing that comes into my life a lot. And I don't generally repurpose them for acrylic because I don't think that you should take oil brushes into your acrylic painting. I don't think you can get them back in and clean enough to really do that, in my experience. I agree. I agree. Although if you have acrylics, there's no harm in using those acrylics for watercolor because their watercolor is not going to hurt them. But yeah, you don't want to you don't right. want to ruin a watercolor brush by getting acrylic paint stuck in the ferrule, and you don't want oil yeah, residue in your acrylics. Up, so. You're just asking for uh, paintbrush trouble. Yeah. <laughs> right. What's next? Uh, someone's looking for advice on getting started with charcoal pencils. What brands and whatnot? Oh, brands of charcoal pencils. Marty, have you done a lot of reviews on those? Well, I, I haven't, but I've used a lot of them. And, you know, uh, I, I, Conti makes a great charcoal pencil. It's a little bit more costly. If you're just starting out, I'd say go with the General. It's The General's is cheap, uh, inexpensive, but it works pretty good. Um, and if you're not afraid of getting your hands a little dirty, which, let's face it, that's what art part of what art's all about, um, like use some vine charcoal or, or, or some chunky charcoal. Like get a real feel. I like to connect with, uh, with the uh, art supply that I'm using or the medium I'm using. I don't care if I get dirty or whatever. It's, you can always wash that off, right? But it, there's, there's nothing like experiencing the, the tactile sensation of the real thing in your hands. So. Excellent. Well, we've got about... I can't oh, stand the feel of it on my hands. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we got about um, seven or eight minutes left, so we're going to try to rapid fire through a few questions here. Um, what do we have next? Uh, Lisa, have you found any more out about uh, light fast sprays to put in ink dense pencils? No, I've purchased several, but being that it's winter and there's not a whole lot of sun here right now, I haven't done it. And I have the sprays. I also have some of the UV. Word just left my brain. The UV glass, I have that to test, so I will be testing that out this summer to see how it goes. I have one piece hanging in my house, but it doesn't get direct sunlight. My red panda is behind UV glass, and so far, no fading, but again, he's not actually exposed to light either way, so um, that's the extent of my 
my experimenting so far. All right, we'll have to stay tuned. Yeah. Someone said they just made your Katniss cowl, and they love it. Awesome! <laughs> uh, what's a good jet black ink pen? Uh, jet black ink pen. Let's see. I wonder pen what... Pen, ink, or brush? Just said, it just says jet black pen. Well, there's all kinds of pens. There's t uh, millions of different kinds of pens, but if you want the best thing, get a nib pen and some black lawyer's ink. Because that stuff's made the last 400 years. I mean, there was documents signed in the 1600s that still exist that were signed with that ink. It's not cheap. It's called lawyer's ink. It comes in a walnut or a black, but it lasts forever. And uh, that's good stuff. And you could even fill up, um, like, uh, the Pentel brush pens with that, which I've used. As long as it, it doesn't have such a high shellac uh, content, you can use those pretty easy and rinse them out, and they're good, you're good to go. Excellent. And with all the dip pen nib options that you have, you really could have an unlimited um, style of pens, too, for your, for, sure. uh, for your money. So it really wouldn't yeah. be that expensive, I think, versus getting a slew of pens that might dry out on you. Exactly. You can't go wrong with Pigma Microns, too, if you just yep. look at them nice and jet black. They're fairly thin. But, um, they're waterproof, too, if you want a watercolor yeah, on them. Exactly. Which is really nice. Yeah. Yep. Uh, Marty, or, is this Koinor? Koinor pencils, yes. light fast, or will they fade over time? They they are pretty light fast actually. And my test, they 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 do good for about three weeks or so. Um, you know, in a in a indirect direct sun. Do you disagree, Lacry? So, uh, three you're, weeks is not light fast. fast. <laughs> <laughs> well, light I'm, fast. Talking about, I'm talking about direct sun. I'm talking about direct sunlight on them all day long, day after day. Yeah, as but far as I know, has, that company hasn't them. tested them, has it? Have they? No, but if you go on the Pencil UK guide, mm -hmm. they have that, and I've tested them myself. And like I said, three weeks, and I have some. I have the taped off color and the untaped. And believe me, there's lots of colored pencils that fade a hell of a lot faster than those do. So I think they're 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 probably about a little bit above average in my tests. All right. Your results may vary. <laughs> Don't put them in direct sunlight, no matter what. Color yeah, there you go. <laughs> they don't mind UV glass, and you're probably fine. Exactly. For sentiment regarding underpaintings, how do you choose your colors for your underpainting, and do your choices differ from realistic colored paintings to pop art painting? Yeah, they do differ a lot if you're doing a realistic painting to a pop art painting. The wonderful thing about layering uh, painting and art and using color and color theory to get a result is, is there's a tremendous range of techniques and ideas that you can use. Um, you know, if you were doing something very classical, you might do your underpaintings in very neutral colors, like umbers, and you might do, like we talked about recently, like an umber study, and then build up a painting. But, um, you know, another fun one that's really hot right now, you're seeing on Pinterest, if you watch uh, Angela Moulton, the Daily Painter, she loves to use our quinacridone magenta as her underpainting, and then she pops that with those aquas, and it's just vibrant. The painting just feels like it glows. Mm. So this is a whole study you can get into. I love sharing this with you guys on the show because my goal is one of the best workshops that I still love to take is to go with someone who's like a color master and get into one of their color theory workshops because everybody has these unique formulas. It's kind of like our art alchemy and it's probably one of the most fun. Um, in my own fine art practice, I tend to actually love to work with contrast. I love to play contrasting colors against each other in a canvas. Um, and for the pop art, obviously we keep them in the bright, bright, brights. And I saw something, I don't know if she's still here, but yes, I do watch Gravity Falls. I watch it a lot. <laughs> oh, that was my son. Yeah, was Ethan, yeah. <laughs> he loves Gravity Falls. He's yeah. <laughs> well, very good. Do we have any other any other questions we can? Yeah, if you want. Yeah, uh, you guys. Do you guys have a few more minutes, or are you? Yeah, we're good. Yeah. I'm I don't good. Wanna, don't want to infringe on your time. We'll do it. We'll do a, go a couple more minutes and see if we can nail out a few more questions. Uh, Lisa, can you review the Spectrum Noir color pencils? <laughs> Maybe. We'll see. I know they're not as good as what I'm using, so it's hard for me to want to spend money on a product that I know is not going to be as good. But I know you guys want me to review it, so eventually, probably. 
Lisa, let me talk to you afterwards because I could put you in contact with the company and hopefully get you a complimentary okay. set too. Yeah, they, they sent me all that stuff, so it's pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think they're they're kind of a decent um, a crafters brand where you're doing like rubber stamping and you're not doing covering a huge amount, but um, but it's harder to lay. I think layer the pigment that you like to do. I think it might yeah, be a little bit. Yeah, which is not going to be what. Yeah. So. Well, I took them in the field, and I I got like eleven or twelve layers down. That may not be a lot for you, Lisa, but it worked for me pretty good. I was just doing field sketching. Now, how would you say they compare to like the? Derwent Colorsoft, because that's the problem I had with them, too. They don't layer either. Are they yeah. similar, do you think, to those? I, I think they're better than the Derwent Colorsoft, and it pains me to say that because I love the old Cumberland Pencil Company. Yeah, I love and, Derwent. Uh, I just don't like that product. Right, See, I love either, the so. Colorsoft. Yeah. I, I think they're nice and rich and opaque because I like to work on colored paper a lot. But then again, I'm not putting tons of layers. I like to work fast. Yeah, so, so that they're could perfect be like, for that. They, they yeah, did, I, I did a quick sketch on my recent Smart Art Box, and I loved them for what I did that, just really quickly laying it down. Down, but for layering, they were not good. It's such a personal thing, too, you know. Yeah. Everyone's sort of techniques are going to demand different tools, so. Yeah, that's right. It, and one of the things with the um, with the uh, Spectrum Noir pencils is that I think one of the techniques that they were designed for, because they're fairly transparent, I think they're for going over like the Spectrum Noir markers, so you can like enhance like a Copic or a, any yes. alcohol marker or even like water-based yeah. marker illustration by just layering on that translucent pencil and it's it's just a ticket for that you wouldn't need a, a pricier pencil you would yeah. want a more opaque pencil for that they're kind of smooth and then I think it complements that technique really well and I think that's because those those products I think are designed to go together and that might be why um, they they're have those creamy. characteristics they're creamy and they're vibrant which I really liked because I was doing like drawing some chilies and some flowers uh, at the conservatory, but they were great. They worked good for me. I, it's too I bad you them. can't get them open stock, so you could try a few before you invested. But the nice thing yeah. I I will say about their line, and no other pencil company that I know of does this. Like their for their floral set of twenty four. You, if you buy that and then you buy the landscape or the ocean set or whatever it is, the marine set, there are new, no duplications between sets. So That's right. Yeah. The See, that would be a huge like, issue for me though, and I would never seriously work with a colored pencil that I couldn't buy open stock. That's I think you need like, to have both. Yeah, you need yeah. both elements. But I like the fact that because some because you know if you buy a set of um of any other brand, whether it be like Dur any of the Derwent since you buy a set of twelve and then you go buy the set of twenty four, you've got twelve of those yes. colors duplicated. So it's yeah. it's frustrating if you're just trying out a small set, then you want to save money and get a larger one, and you you're getting doubles of of yeah. ones you've already purchased. So yeah. All right. What's next? Uh, any thoughts on Liquitex? Oh, thoughts on Liquitex. We talked about the basics line early. That's what um, Lisa likes. I love the heavy body. The caps are super easy to take off if you have any <laughs> sort of like um, issues like unscrewing those top. Like sometimes the caps get like get caked with stuff, and I haven't had the issue with any of my Liquitex. Like the caps always come right off. But thumbs up to Liquitex. <laughs> Sponsor us, Liquitex. They're, they're self cleaning caps. <laughs> oh, okay. That's why. Awesome. Very good. Now people are starting to talk about Gravity Falls. Oh. We're losing them. <laughs> oh, no. no, no. <laughs> well, I got a question here from the website. Um, and this woman says, uh, this is from Tammy. Um, she says, her question for anyone is, how is the best way to attach a book cover? I have two art books. One is 21 years old, and the other is 19 years old. Both book spines are broken and lost. The covers are about to come apart. Should I just use duct tape? Thank you for any tips you can give me. No duct tape. <laughs> is this a sketchbook, or is it uh, an old volume? I, I, have a, I, I reckon she means like an old art book, like a book of, um, maybe it's an art instruction book or something, yeah. but... This is right in my wheelhouse because oh, I did some conservation work. But take it to a reputable book binder, spend the money. It'll be the best money you ever spent, believe me. They're going to do a great job and you won't go. Sometimes, you know, it, life's just like that. Don't, don't do it yourself. Take it to, like plumbing. I don't do that. <laughs> but if it's if it's not something that's valuable, though, and she wants, and she wants to do it herself, would you have any advice? Well... I mean, it's a, you can ruin the book actually doing it yourself, but yeah, I, I, I hesitate to, uh, to put forward too much advice there, but yeah, I mean, there is some conservation tape you can buy, for, from a, from, not from a binder, but you can go to like a craft store. I think they sell the stuff with, uh, it's got cloth in it, so mm -hmm. the cloth is woven into the tape and the tape is, is acid-free and stuff, and I think uh, it, it has other purposes, but I think you could use something like that. Matter of fact, I, I thought I saw it at Hobby Lobby, but 
if it's a real cheap book and you don't care and it's you know there's thousands of them out there I suppose that's okay okay very good and no, no, she said she one? didn't get it on my Facebook page whoops oh I don't think I think that was uh, Karen best watercolor series Karen Dosh I bet you they're talking about is it C A R A N yes yeah, they're talking about Karen Dosh Museum Aquarelle or the Karen Dosh Neo Color or the Karen. There's a whole bunch of Karen Dosh. And I know Lisa will agree with me. Probably some of the best pencils in the world, wouldn't you say, Lisa? Absolutely. Yeah, I'll be reviewing their graphite pencils here soon, too. So I'm excited about that one. Excellent. They're good. And try their washes while you're at it because those are great, the Karen Dosh graphite wash pencils. Oh, I need to check those out. I tried the Faber Castell and loved, loved the Faber Castell. The they are water soluble. The 8B is like a go-to if you want really dark darks. But the Karen Dosh, like I said earlier, the Swiss, they're craftsmen when it comes to these pencils. They are yeah. just 4 millimeter core. I just sometimes, I just like to go to the art store to hold the pencil. <laughs> I just look at them and it's like, oh, hallelujah. It's, they're beautiful. Very good. And I love their watercolor crayons. Those those have been my favorite for like 15 years. I got the set of 84. Um, this was like 15 years ago. It was before oh, I had kids. It was $60. It was like the sold steel. those crayons. It was so awesome. I love those. Um, well, I want to thank you guys for joining us tonight. And if you, um, we have like right now, like 475 people watching us live right now. I didn't get a chance. I, did, I forgot to peek during the broadcast, but um, that's totally crazy and awesome. And I am so happy. That is crazy. That's so awesome. So if we didn't get to your question, I apologize. I want to be respectful to everybody's time and wrap this up. But leave your question in the comments as soon as the broadcast is over, and I will look around through there. Maybe if these guys have a little time, they might check it out and, and help you. I will help you. Um, that way we can get everyone's questions answered, hopefully. And just thank you so much. Make sure you check out these guys' channels. There's an info card in one of these corners. I don't know, because sometimes the thing films backwards. So one of these corners is an info card with their channel. <laughs> in the video description is their channels again they are all worth a subscription it's free to subscribe and you gotta check these guys out thank you all for thank hanging out guys. with me tonight thanks for having us awesome. alright happy crafting thank you bye, bye.